politics. I want people to enjoy this and it's, it's long form. So we just sit there and talk and talk about fishing. I'm going to, I'm going to ask you questions about uh, your sonar because that's kind of like the topic here at home. Everybody's getting these sonars and there's a couple of guys here at home that are really, really good at it. But after talking to you about it in Australia, uh, yeah, you got it down to a science. Uh, how how long are we going to chat there? Because I, I forgot I had another appointment at, at about quarter past nine. So at a, oh, nine. you're good. Yeah, yeah, you're good. I'm not. Uh, worst case scenario, we just you let me know and we can cut it off. Okay. But uh, we usually usually talk about an hour. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. I mean, if it's if it's really good conversation, I'll talk forever. <laughs> oh geez thanks <laughs> yeah no no i could i could really talk forever if you cut me off in 10 minutes that means obviously my conversation's not good enough man i've had a couple times where it was pretty tough but i don't think this will be a hard a hard one <laughs> i've had a couple of ones where you know just people i've never talked with and yeah. uh didn't really know uh yeah. we can if nothing else we can make fun of sparrow yeah <laughs> listen <laughs> listen we could talk we could talk I haven't had him on the show yet. I, he, you know who I did have on the show uh, was Lily Sims. I don't know if you know Lily. Her parents. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I had her. He called me up and he's like, you got to have Lily on there. I'm like, I don't know Lily, but sure. Why not? <laughs> cool. <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's have Lily on here. And we did. And Lily was phenomenal. So we Isn't all. Isn't that great? I, I, I love that. You know, like it just, it's given Greg, you know this i mean he i mean he's passionate fisherman like like the rest of us but all of a sudden he's he's got this you know um i don't know it's his daughter it's his daughter i think it's his daughter yeah yeah it's his daughter for some reason i thought it may have been his niece but yeah i'm like no i'm sure it's his daughter um his son his son doesn't is not so into it but his lily is you know and 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 um i reckon it's magic you know and I, she just smokes think, out for them i think it's awesome so yeah. We can continue talking about her, but let's get this party started right now. And we are back. Here I am, Fly Navarre with the No BS World Tour, coming at you middle of the day, my time, but bright, early, sunshiny morning for Tommy Francis down in Tahiti, captain of the Ultimate Lady. Tommy, how are you, sir? Very good, Fly. Very good. Hanging in there pretty good. So, uh, for anybody that's watching or listening to right now, or have never been to Tahiti, uh, tell us uh, what we're missing right now. Well, you know, Tahiti's, it's an incredible place, beautiful tropical islands. Um, there's, you know, and Tahiti's just the main island and, and, you know, it's, it's in a group of something like 180 odd islands and, and it's, uh, and which is known as French Polynesia. And the uh, thing I love about Tahiti is the diversity of it. You know, you've got, you've got the two motors, which are low lying atolls and um, it's probably similar to your Bahamas, uh, beautiful lagoons, coral reefs. And then in the North, you've got the Marquesas, which are towering high uh, sort of uh, uh, jungle islands, cliffs, uh, Coming back down to Tahiti and the Society Islands, Tahiti, Huahini, Raiatea, Bora Bora, which is the famous one. We're all surrounded by reef again. We have internal lagoons and, and we've got the same sort of picturesque jungle and mountain peaks. Um, and then, you know, Austral Islands without lagoon uh, uh, surrounding reef. Uh, they're, again, they're different, they're a little bit cooler. And so there's so much diversity here. And, and we we love it because you know you can there's all these different groups of islands you can go to with fish and 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 get remote or you can stay with with the civilization if you like of resort life and touristic sort of activities and yeah that's no, a good good spot well you have a, a pretty unique uh platform when you're fishing and traveling around the islands uh if you could uh, describe, not only tell people what the ultimate lady is, but describe exactly what she looks like and how it helps to be able to go and do some of the things you do. It, it looks like a, I've heard a couple of expressions. It's a, it's a, 
it's a monohull on training on training wheels because you know we've got that we're a wave piercer right so a catamaran wave piercer so you know the hulls are sort of uh, are designed to pierce through the waves and and of course you've got this big flared bow and like a traditional sport fishing boat and but it looks like it's just been plonked on these training wheels, which are the hulls. Um, and then another person's described it as a wedding cake because, um, you know, we've got, the, we've got a you know, dark blue topside and, and, like I said, flared and, and sort of rolling shear line that coasts back and, you know, sort of the cockpit area at the back sort of squares off a little bit and, you know, very sort of traditional air. And, and, and then the, the coach house and, and uh, we call the superstructure and the sort of the fly bridge and, uh, and which is enclosed and, and of course the tower arrangement. So it's, you know, there's the, the layers there. And uh, so, yeah, we've been described as a wedding cake and, 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 a, and, a, and a sport fisher on training wheels. So. so she is, is, correct me if I'm wrong, 30 foot wide. Yeah. Yeah. She's yeah. 30 foot wide. I mean, you're, we're not talking about uh, just a, a narrow boat. She is huge. Yeah. yeah. Huge. We, we're talking, you know, it, it's funny. I, I was on at the end of the season in 2018, I was with Sparrow. And, and, and uh, of course, I, I come back into a, a, a 40 foot boat. And I'm like, oh, God, it's a, it's a little bit small. <laughs> And you, you just get used to the beam, um, like the inter internal volume that a catamaran affords, and especially one like Ultimate Lady that's got a 30-foot beam. It, it's incredible. You get used to all this space, and then all of a sudden you hop back on a, a traditional sport fish. It doesn't matter if it's 50 or 60 foot, like a big boat. You know, you still go, oh, it's, it's, um, it's tight. It's a different animal. It's a whole different animal. There's a, there's a lot that uh, people don't understand with – when you have the beam, which is the width of the boat, uh, that that's a lot of space. Length is one thing, but width is something else. Cause when, uh, you're sitting in the salon of a boat, which for people that aren't familiar with boats, that's your living room. Uh, and you have the whole width of the boat, which is 30 foot. That's a 30 foot salon by however amount of space for and aft. So that's, that's a lot of area and I've been inside your boat and, uh, it's massive. And it, uh, the term wedding cake is used here in the States quite often with, uh, all the new Viking boats that have these sky bridges and your boat does have that extra layer where it, it looks like, okay, yeah, he's driving from up top where the, the little, uh, husband and wife are at. And, uh, so. <laughs> The it's wedding. the wedding cake <laughs> it's the wedding cake so uh now you before we got came on air uh you were telling me that um because of a lot of the lockdowns that we're all going through you haven't had very many guests since january last year but if you can describe where are some of the places that you guys go last i saw you uh we were both uh on the great barrier reef uh, so you were, you had taken the trip from Tahiti to Australia and you guys tour quite a bit of the South Pacific. So if you can describe a little bit of, you know, what you guys do and where you guys go, uh, right. stuff like that. we've, we've, we've been in Tahiti now since 2009 and, and we, we, we were touring prior to that. We were touring around the, the South Pacific, uh, you know, we did every season in Cairns and we sort of based out of Vanuatu and we would sort of venture down to this Norfolk Island, which is down, you know, 600 miles north of New Zealand. And, and we would fish our Wanganella Bank um, area there. And that's a, that's a mid-ocean seamount structure and the, and the striped marlin fishing there is phenomenal. And so we were, we were moving around um, sort of every three, four, six months, uh, depending on the season. Gold Coast, Blue Marlin, which is epic there. Cairns, Heavy Tackle, which you've done. And, um, New Caledonia, Vanuatu, uh, you know, and down to Norfolk. We're sort of circling around there. And, and, and then we were like, well, let's, let's get over to Tahiti. And, and uh, we talked to Peter B. Wright. He, he was on board and he was talking about some, some of his friends and some of the fish he'd heard being caught, you know, south of Tahiti in, a, in this place called the Austral Islands. And uh, we had this theory of, you know, the cooler water. 
similar to New Zealand, you know, down in New Zealand there, the, you, you're lucky if you catch a, a, a blue marlin under 300 pounds. And uh, where in the tropics, you, you get a lot of 100 pounders, 200 pounders. And, and so, you know, the cooler water, bigger fish. And then if you look at, I'm not an expert on the Madeira, Madeira or Cape Verde, well, Cape Verde gets small ones, but the Madeira and the Azores, you know, they traditionally don't get a lot of smaller ones. It's all, you know, average. Bigger average fish. Ones. Yeah, cooler water, bigger fish. So we're like, let's test this theory out. We don't want to go back to New Zealand. We've we've <laughs> we've done ten years there already. So let's um, in the tropics. Where can we go? And and uh, so we headed out to Tahiti. And and um, since being in Tahiti for ten years, we've we've gone back to Australia, which is a four thousand mile um, journey, uh, three times now. So and in between, we always fish sort of Tonga or Samoa or. or you stop off and, and uh, quite often did that. So that was always fun. Um, but we, we came to Tahiti and, and we thought we we're going to stay for a year. And I said, it's ridiculous, Fred, the owner of the boat. I said, we've come all this way, 4,000 nautical miles. It, let's, let's stay for two years. You know, let's make the most of it. This place is huge. You know, the Marquesas, Gambia, Tuamotus, Australia. So... Um, yeah, we've been touring around here. And as I said, we've gone back and forth to Australia, but touring around here and uh, we're, we're, we love it here. The, the infrastructure to, to keep a boat like this here is, is fantastic. Um, the infrastructure to do charters and, and the support you can get. I, I, in, in the outer islands, you, you've got phone service and, and flights like, and fuel. And um, so flights mean a guest can fly in, means spare parts can fly in, and it means, you know, the providors, the guys servicing food, we can send fresh food in. So it, it makes this remote stuff so much easier. And um, the, phone, the phone signal thing might, might, might be a bit funny, but I, I remember touring around the South Pacific and Vanuatu and stuff, and it, it, there was no phone signal or internet anywhere. You had to, you had to use a satellite phone. So... It was, it was a big thing. If someone lives on an island here in Tahiti, an atoll, island, there's, there's phone service and you've got, you've got the internet. Um, but, yeah, the, the, the flights and, of course, the trading ships that, that come, there's always fuel there. And, and uh, so that makes things a lot easier. And, uh, yeah, we, you know, our favourite fish, my favourite fishing spots would be the Marquesas. Um, and then sort of almost at the opposite end of the of French Polynesia down to the south is the Gambia. And those two places, you know, you've got Gambia in the south of slightly cooler water. But we're talking about there's, there's, we've only been there once, but we've, you know, the fishing we've had there has been very good. Um, there's obviously some sort of current that comes in there because the big fish are just out the front, you know, and they're the local boats. There's two or three of them. They're, catching 900 pounds every year you know they get a couple of them every year wow yeah yeah it's it's that's it's no joke we we were there we jumped off an 800 pound black we fished for 30 days did three trips 10 days each we we weighed one that was 715 pounds we we let go another one the following day from that one that was similar size 700 pounder we caught a couple of 600 pounders we didn't get a 900 but but um you know, Still, those are those are nice fish. These are great fish, and they're good numbers. And and I don't know why we haven't gone back there, but it's it's nine hundred miles from Tahiti, so it's a, it's a bit of a stretch. It's another three hour flight from Tahiti to get down there. But but like I say, the flights are there. To, I can get everything in there. And I as far as a serious sport fishing destination, this place is it's got it. It's it's great. So that's, that's one of my favourites. And the Marquesas, you know, you've got a group of islands that are just so wild and, and uh, you know, untamed, savage. And, and, you know, again, you've got the flights coming in there. Uh, you've got the equatorial current that pumps in there. So quite often you get a bit of green water. But when, once you get into that good water and the, the fish are there, the fish is, it's, it's amazing there. So for people that are not familiar with the geography for Tahiti, let's ask a couple of questions. Number one, um, if you were coming from mainland United States, what is the best route to get there? 
Yeah, so LA, LA Tahiti, LA Papiti. Um, okay. Yep, and you, so you fly in there. It's an eight-hour flight. And uh, once you eight, get to- eight, did you say eight hours? Eight hours. Oh, that's nothing. That's a cakewalk. Cake eight walk. hours. Eight <laughs> hours is a cakewalk. Yeah. There you go. It's. I never thought I'd ever say that, but uh, eight hours is not bad, yeah. especially from LA. So it makes it very, very easy. Yep, yeah. and th- and that's another great thing, you know about tahiti and we i particularly liked it i I snowboard so every every year i like i'd go to i'm only eight hours to america whereas when i was in new zealand i was 12 hours and it's you know that extra four hours is a is a a lot a lot that extra part so i i loved it and we were central and pacific it was it's five hours from the boss and new zealanders to get up here and of course eight from from la so it's it's a great location very that's that's very very easy that's very easy and so uh from you what you said it's it's a four thousand mile trip from tahiti to australia yeah. now do you guys do that as a straight shot or do you stop along the way we, we stop along the way we usually stop in samar pango pango and and we we bunk a fuel there so pango is six days for us uh, and we, we could do the whole trip if we wanted to. We've got about a, a 5,000 mile range on Ultima Lady, but that, that's at seven knots. And, and we prefer to travel a lot faster than that. And, and you know, the, the, seven, the seven knot trip to Australia, I, I, I mean, I, it's 25 or 27 days or 30 days or something roughly. And, and I'd rather do it in 20 days. So I, I can, I, I, carry we carry 21,000 liters of fuel and, and that's how much fuel I'd burn from Tahiti to to Australia to Cairns okay. and so I stop off basically as a precaution for emergency you know and, and we we travel in that sort of on the way there it's great in August you're down sea you've got a trade wind behind you and, and you surf along at 12 knots 10 12 knots yeah. oh that ain't bad at all no that's that's good it's good going that way coming back is a bit different but but uh coming back do you go straight back or do you kind of try to bounce along a little bit we we coming back you know cans finishes it's it's a it's a cans finishes into early december so call it so we'd either try and get away in december or we have left you know january and february um leaving cans we would head north you know the coral sea is the coral sea in that north of fiji is a it was a cyclone breeding ground and hurricane breeding ground, whatever you want to call them. And uh, we would, we would head, head north. So we would extend our trip. And this is where the 4,000 miles comes in. It is, is heading north up to about 11 degrees south. You know, hurricanes form at that 10 degrees south um, zone. And then they, then they come south and they gain, gain uh, uh, pressure and, and velocity, I guess. And, um, so we'd head up there and, and then truck east and then come down to Samoa and, and that would sort of keep us north of the of the dangerous cyclone area. Yeah. That's uh, for anybody that is around the water, cyclones, hurricanes, typhoons, it's just one of those things that we got to deal with. Uh, it's unfortunately, it's just part of mother nature. And uh, I know growing up, uh, fishing St. Thomas for so many years, it was just you dodge storms all year long. Yeah, yeah. That's that's just part of being on a boat. Yeah. At the in the in the beginning, you know, I grew up on a sailing boat, and, and uh, my parents are like, "Well, you you, you you can't do that," and, and it's a cyclone season, and, and I see, yeah, it's a bit different on older Malay versus a forty-six foot sailing, you know, family cruising boat, you know, and and. We, first of all, we've got the range and the speed to sort of, you know, get it, drive around or get away. And um, I, I don't want to sound like I'm sort of ignorant, arrogant or something that I, I think I'm better than cyclones, but I, I'm <clears throat> definitely not. I definitely, when we're crossing these areas at these particular times, it's, it's a nervous time for me. But, you know, we've got this, we've got great sat- satellite communications with and we can watch um um, weather systems developing and stuff and we can we can alter our route and change course and increase speed or slow down and so we've we've although it's a very nervous time when you when you're traversing these areas right at peak season 
Um, it's also the bet calmest time as well. You know, we, we, I'm guessing it's the same overseas, you know, where you get the doldrum area and that's where the hot, hot water and the storms form. And they usually got very calm weather. So, so it's a great time to travel. It's an awesome time to travel. <laughs> But yeah, yeah, you just you always, you know, I'm always on the weather, on you know, routing and, and looking at that. It, and the the thing with storms is you can, if you're traveling in front of them, it's flat calm, but you don't want something to happen because then you can't get out of the way. And I I, I know people who have blown engines or transmissions trying to get you know, back home and they're trying to stay in front, you know, far enough in, in front of a storm. Uh, but then you get on the backside, it's just as flat calm, but then you got to deal with all the debris. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know about down in Tahiti way, but you know, when a storm comes through the Caribbean and it goes through all the islands and, uh, then the Bahamas, you know, there's, there's a lot of debris in the water. I've, I've seen some pretty crazy things. Uh, I've seen, uh houses roofs wow yeah it's i was just telling somebody a story the other day that we actually found an island and they're like what do you mean an island you found an island and it was a uh and i don't know where it came off of and if i'm correct it was hurricane opal but i don't quote me on that one we were coming home after the hurricane and uh somewhere it was either in the dominican republic or puerto rico it was a, a whole knot of bamboo broke loose somewhere in a mountain, got rushed down. And I would say it was probably about 150 bamboo shoots wow. and the whole ball of roots. Well, the ball of roots was about 20 foot down, but the bamboo shoots stuck up in the air, probably about a hundred feet. So you look, when you're looking at this thing a mile away, it's like, what is that? And as you get closer, it looks like a little, a small little island and it's just floating along. I mean, it's, it's a complete showstopper. I mean, God forbid you're running at night. Uh, yeah, it's, it's just, it's one of those things. There's no lighting on it. There's no anything. Uh, now underneath there was more Dorados and Wahoo than you could ever imagine, <laughs> you know, but again, it's, it's all this, deb the debris field after a storm that gets blown uh, whether it gets blown into the water or it gets washed down the side of mountains, it's, it's some incredible stuff uh, that you, you have to be, you got to be concerned about as you're traveling. Yeah, we've, we've never, well, not that I know of, I'm sure we've, it, I'm sure we've hit some things. It, it's always, you know, you traveling, when you travel at nighttime, you kind of worry about hitting things. And then once you do a bit of it, you could go, well, I haven't hit anything yet, but there's always that opportunity. There's always. And you come yeah. so close, you know, like in the morning, you wake up and you look behind you, and there's, there's, there's. I, I've come up to watch, and I've looked out the back, and there's, there's been big logs, and the, and you know, guys on watch haven't seen it or something like that. You just sometimes you just you, you get lucky. There was uh, one time we were going from Bermuda to St. Thomas, which is just under 900 miles. And I was on the real tight at the time. And uh, we had a, a depression start forming off the Bahamas and uh, moved its way offshore. So we ended up going right through the middle of this thing. And it was, it was brutal. I mean, it wasn't, I didn't feel unsafe, just uncomfortable. Uh, it wasn't hundred mile an hour winds. We're talking about, you know, 30 knots, maybe some 35 knot gusts, but it, you know, it lasted for 60 hours and, uh it just it's long it's miserable it's yeah it, it is what it is and when we got into uh when we got into cruise bay or when we were going into cruise bay in st john to clear the sun was just coming up there's just enough light we're getting all the lines ready and when we look behind the boat there was an actual cargo net that got caught on our rudder oh wow how it got on the rudder and not the wheel beats i don't know how it happened we were very very lucky but it was one of those things it, it probably stuck out behind the boat eight or nine feet and as long as you're moving forward it's not a big deal it's, it's just the tail hanging out uh the problem is when it gets spun back around or if you're trying to pull into a slip so we literally um 
we're tucked up behind, behind the island and we were able to, with a gaff, lift it up, cut what we needed to cut out without having to jump in the water. And we got it all off. But it's, again, it's one of those things in the, you don't, cargo netting, you don't see. It doesn't stick up above the water. Uh, most of the time, it's that green color. So it doesn't yeah. even, it just blends in. And who knows when we ran it over, to be honest with you. It could it could have been there for forty eight hours for all we know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's just like you said, it's it's just one of those things. As you travel, uh, not when it happens. It's not if it happens. It's it's when, and and you hope it's not a big deal. And um, yeah, and hopefully, if it's one of those things, it's not a showstopper. It doesn't stop you dead in the water, and uh, you can fix we've it. Got, we've got carbon fiber propellers. And, and it's, I mean, the boat's 20 years old. You think these things are, I mean, they're amazing. I, I can pick one up above my head like that. They're, wow. Uh, a 900 and five bladed, 914 millimeter. I don't know how many inches that is, but you know, it's, you lift it up. And, and so that's always been, this hitting something has always been a concern of ours. And, and because, you know, the, the blade would just crack and shatter. shatter. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, touch wood, you know, we, we haven't hit any, we've, we've had a few fish get under there, unfortunately. And, and, and had a, had who, who, win, who wins the blade or the fish? Sometimes, sometimes, sometimes we win more often the fish wins. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately. Um, but yeah, they're, they're, they're great things, but yeah, we're, we're doubly concerned because they're, they're quite, delicate in in the sense of coming in contact with anything um do you keep a spare with you do you keep a spare to, set of wheels when we go to when we do a long trip yeah i do i carry i carry two sets i carry both both and I, okay i can take them off in the water and put, put, put the other one back on that's that's pretty that's pretty nice considering it doesn't you don't have this giant weight to it yeah yeah i, I know that's the that's the biggest thing is trying to lift that kind of weight underwater. It's not easy. No, no. So yeah, that's it's it's, it's a bit of effort. I mean, sometimes they fly off, you know, with a puller and the, and a the sledgehammer. And if you've ever done any of that work underwater, you'll know it's not easy. And, and I've wrestled with them before and haven't been able to get them off underwater. But then other times, yeah, it's I've been out. In fact, I. I've been wrestling with them in Cairns Harbour in December. So you've got box jellyfish, you've got crocodiles, and and then someone tells me, oh, you want to be careful of those big groper down there. They'll get hold of your fin or your leg or something. <laughs> ah, a grouper will come up and yeah. one <laughs> bite. Engulf them. So I'm down there and then and wrestling with this thing and marina staffs telling me, you're not allowed to swim here this time of year. You know, anyway, I didn't get bitten and didn't get in, in yet <laughs> yet but, uh, another time i i said bugger this i'm not going in here again i older and wise as the years progress you know you get older and wiser and you don't do the things you used to do and uh, i said i'm going we'll go out anchor at the reef there so we anchored at opal and and changed the prop there and nice clear water and and uh, no no bodies it's uh it's funny how as now i, I really want to know is it that we get smarter as we get older or that we get slower and I'm like, I'm not going to try that. <laughs> I'm not going to try that. I, I, I'd like to, but no. I, I like I, Jerry and I, Jerry, you know, Jerry, and he's a long time crewman of ours. He, he comes and goes depending on where we are and what we're doing. And, and uh, we talk about some of the places we used to go in New Zealand and where we used to park the boat and, uh, you know, like how difficult it was to get the boat there. Or, you know, I posted a video of us refueling at Norfolk Island, which is, which is like refueling in the ocean next to a big rock wall, you know, and, and, uh, and the, the surge and we've got the ropes and we're snapping ropes and the, there's this 10, 10 meter hose fuel line. And I'm like, why can't we have a longer hose? And then I could, we don't have to be so close to this wharf. And, and I watched the video again. I think, I don't think I'll do that again now. I, I've done it twice in my younger years and I don't think I'll do it again. It's, it's amazing. It really is. Some of the things, over the years, oh, oh I'm just going to swim this fuel hose out to the boat. Yeah, why not? Sure. 
Yeah, that's yeah. Oh, again, over the years, you think about some of the places you've gone and some of the things just to get fuel, uh, so you can go to the next spot or wait. Uh, I was I was telling somebody a story, and it, it wasn't as crazy on my end. It was just we. I got woken up one night. We were in Harbor Island in the Bahamas. And you hear this racket. It's like, what is that noise? So you get up and you walk outside, make sure there's no problems with the boat. And then you see a, well, you really don't see the boat because there's no lights on it, but he's cutting through all the channels and he's being chased by a helicopter in the dark. Wow. Yeah. And it's like, uh, I did not see anything. I don't want to see anything. Uh, I'm going back to bed and let me get back down below the water line in case something crazy and they're gone anyway. So you just keep going. <laughs> so yeah, there's over the years, there's been some good stories that you can tell. So now you have a project going on in Tahiti right now. And you were telling me about it when I saw you in Cairns and uh, I've been watching it and I don't know if everybody, uh, how many people that are listening have seen it on, on social media. You've been doing a really good job of showing your progression, but you guys are building a boat. That's right. That's right. It's, it's in New Zealand. It's being built in New Zealand, but okay. it, it will eventually come up to come up to Tahiti. Uh, yeah. So, so I wanted, I wanted the boat to, to, there's, there's not much available here. You know, like a lot of people, I've heard it before we came here, people said there's no charter boats there. There's a, there's a few fishing boats, you know, we see a few, you know, um, riggers and towers, you know, floating around, but these boats are, are quite old and they're privately owned. And there's, there's a few smaller boats um, available for charter, outboard sort of things and 27 footer. And uh, down in Bora Bora, there's a 34 Black Watch and another Riviera. And, and uh, and I, I just, you know, we, we've, like yourself, you know, we've come from that professional sport fishing um, industry. And I'm like, we, we can, people we know aren't going to come here and fish on these, on these boats, you know, or if they exactly. do, they're going to be disappointed. And, and some of these people that have these boats are my friends. And I, and I don't mean to, I'm not, I don't mean derogatory towards them or, you know, they're great guys and I've got their business and, and it works. Um, but there's there's a serious fishing for folk and clients that we have and 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 they expect more and they're used to having more and, and so that's so I'm trying to provide that you know ultimately is here and that's what that's what we do but we're trying to provide a boat that's more cost efficient and and, and, and just the charter the charter rate is is more affordable to to more people. Um, the problem the problem laid in it if if I went out and bought a normal 50 foot sport fishing boat, an Aussie one, American one, or whatever. I'd, I'd have the problem of, of um, fishing some of these remote places. Now, I, I just talked about the infrastructure in Tahiti being so good. Now, there's fuel just about everywhere, but there's a lot of places where the logistics of getting fuel off the ship or pre arranging cubes to come down it, it's just a logistical nightmare. So, I wanted a boat that was had amazing range and uh so we could go to the gambier and we could fish for a month and fish multiple charters without the the urgency of having to to um, rely or stop fishing or or book trips between the when the ship arrives or the, not having the logistics of the fuel and uh so so long time ago i i i sort of dreamt up I'm going to, I'm going to have a sport fishing boat in Tahiti and it was the traditional style, but then I thought about the logistics of fuel. And as I, as we fished more throughout Tahiti, we learned that, that some of the infrastructure, the, some of the remote places, the places where we really wanted to go, um, wasn't so easy. So <clears throat> the talking to the naval architect, Craig Looms, who, who's the designer of Ultimate Lady, really clever guy, uh, and his team, of course. And, uh, they suggested, well, why don't we look at this narrow hull form sort of design? And, it, and the more I looked into that, I thought, this is us. You know, why not? Why not have a really efficient boat? Now, 
you know, in America, that's it appears to be a race to who's the fastest sport fishing boat out there. And, and, and there's a lot of places like I'm sure in the Gulf of Texas and where you have to run a hundred or plus miles and, and you need that fast boat to, to get out and get back. Um, on Older Milady, we, we, we don't run, we can do 30 knots, but which is slow in today's boats, but, um, we don't run anywhere. We'd rather go slower, go further and stay out longer in, in more comfort. So with that theory, I, I wanted to apply that same principle to a, to a smaller boat. I didn't want a catamaran. And uh, so this narrow hull form came about and, and um, we basically ensured it, it, the, the hull's pretty much like a yacht hull. Yachts are very easily driven and um, we've just put a big engine in it. Uh, a, a single engine? Single engine. Okay. Single. So yachts, yachts are also extremely maneuverable. Once they get flow over that rudder, they, yachts can spin end on end and, and they can actually steer and reverse. So we use those principles and, and I thought, yeah, well, let's, let's have a crack. And one of the deciding factors was there was a guy called Ash Mitchell, which is the cray fisherman that fishes the Three Kings Islands in New Zealand, right? The Three Kings Islands are uh, 50 miles off the top of the co- off New Zealand and, really rough water and he fishes in this sort of traditional you know west coast cray fishing boat sort of style and and i don't know down easter alexa sort of down east boat kind of thing and and all sorts of weather and everything but in his off time in his summer he he likes to go marlin fishing now he went to the wonganel banks with a single engine and he caught like 25 mile now he's got a big deck and he's got lots of people hooked up so a little bit different but I'm like, if he can go and catch 25 mile with a single engine boat, we, you know, we can, we can do it. Um, we, we can still fish, you know, almost as good as a, a twin engine sport fisher with a single engine. And of course, single engine is more efficient, less maintenance, um, um, less capital cost, less outlay in the beginning. So, so they're, they're, that's how it went, and we sort of came up with this boat, and and um, basically put a made a made a yacht hull into a fishing boat with a tower on it, and and Craig Looms made it look really sexy, and and uh, made the lines look really nice, and and uh, as the as the project develops, you know, we there was some other ideas that came about, and and uh, one of the really interesting ones is the the CPP propeller, which is controllable pitch propeller. And uh, Craig, Craig mentioned it to me as a, as a, for sport fishing, changing gear, reverse and forward to, to, you know, there'll be no clunking and no damage to the gearbox. The CPP propeller, you control the pitch of the propeller. And, uh, the pitch C- of the kind propeller. of like an airplane. Yeah, like an airplane um, um, turbine, uh, not turbine propeller. Yep, yeah. same I they ch- they change the pitch to go from forward to reverse. Yes. It keeps spinning in the same direction no matter what. Same direction. So no, I have no idea about these. I know they're on big fishing trawlers and they're used, you know, because as, as a trawler fishing boat, the load varies. You know, they are either full of full of fish, so they're very heavy, so they can change the pitch, like changing your gear on your bicycle, sort of thing. And they and they get more efficiency and they get and. But what, what excited me about this is, is, as I looked into it more, they told me the, the manufacturers of the CPP unit said, well, you can set your engine at 80% RPM and then you can change the, gear, change the pitch. So in that sport fishing um, application, one of the problems with, with um, as you know, that is – the spool up time from going ahead to neutral, going ahead, neutral, down revs, yeah. reverse, First. then increasing revs. And, and it takes time to, 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 for the engine to spool up. And of course, if you need acceleration, i.e. closing that gap, that distance very, very quickly in a short amount of time is, is key for light tackle or any catching really big ones. Um, so with the CPP, we can have the engine already spooled up. You have all the power there in the propeller and you just change the pitch. And, and the pitch can be very fine to, to, to very aggressive. And you can, and you can any, anything in between. Um, 
So the more we looked at it, I thought, yeah, this is this is worth a try. It's, it, it's a all the theories there. We've just we've just got to test it out. We'll see. I, I, I love the way how you preface it with the theories there, and yeah. we all know the difference between theory and reality. We do. And I'll be the first to admit, you know, there's been a lot of great theories out there and, and, and they haven't worked out so good. But but um, this Listen, is all- there, there, there was a theory that the earth was flat. And yeah. as much as we've traveled, we should have fallen off by now. <laughs> you, know, you, you watch those guys. They, this is society. They, they're going to come to you. <laughs> the flat earthers. Yeah. I, I, listen, I'm not I'm not trying to make piss anybody off well that's not true I, I seem to piss off it's it's proportional it, it's a percentage it's like 10 percent. so if i talk to a thousand people in a day i piss off about 10 percent. but if i talk to a hundred thousand it's still 10 <laughs> percent. <laughs> yeah so and, and that, that's what you believe in that's fine i just uh anyway but going back to theory it, it listen i love the fact that you keep your engine at the same speed And there's a a lot of times I've heard stories of when engines, when you do have problems with engines or parts is, is when you're spooling stuff up, you're, you're increasing this load. Uh, It's trying to do it really quickly. You know, know. exactly. And uh, like you said, when you're chasing a fish uh, that, okay, you got to put it in neutral first before you go into reverse. Uh, And even still with the newer engines, they let you because they're all computerized uh if you decide to go full throttle forward into full throttle reverse the computer tells it to slow down get into neutral once it's at a at a manageable rpm then it'll put you in gear but there's still this timing there's a huge timing issue and that makes a big big difference yeah so the the so we're, we're excited to test that aspect and then of course, the other the other problem, like everyone knows in sport fishing, the the how do you how do you steer in reverse? You've got this, you got to, you're gonna fight this prop walk. Everyone's prop walk, and and this is the other thing that CPP is designed for. It it's designed for it, it's well known in big ships for stopping and 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 accelerating, i.e., get stopping the boat from moving and getting it moving again. So in a docking situation, um, I've seen them in action and and. It's incredible what they can do with a, a reasonably big boat with the CVB. Again, the engine is a constant speed. It's already already running and, it, and it's designed 100% output on it. Is at the fingertips of this blade of, of this propeller. So when we start in reverse, you can start with a very fine pitch, which helps acceleration. You know, we know we know GNS for instance under pitches their props and probably a lot of boats do now under pitch their props in order to increase the acceleration at the expense of top end but so the cpp you can do that you because you, you can control a pinch you, you start off with a fine pitch and you have very minimal prop walk at that fine pitch and then as you as you get flow over the rudder the, the rudder then becomes the the, the steering device that it's, and it's pretty neat because of the fact that you're steering it from the front uh, everything else just follows. Yeah, everything else follows. So, in a, in my time on a yacht, you know, you 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 could do that. You could reverse a yacht in. I don't know if you've seen yachts coming into the slips and stuff. They reverse in and they, and they on the wheel and they they've got quite a bit of maneuverability. So, we're hoping it's going to be like that. Well, I've I've seen sailboats do it. I've seen sailboat big sailboats do it. Uh, most of the bigger yachts I've seen, they're you know they're twin engines. Yeah. Um, plus the, then you have bow thrusters and all that other kind of stuff. But, uh, I've seen some sailboats and people who know how to do it, it. It really is amazing, uh, that you have that kind of control with uh, a single screw. Yeah. Yeah. It's, sure. it, it's, it's not, it's not easy, you no. know, in, in, until you know it, once you know it, then, um, like when I'm giant tuna fishing, we're fishing on that lobster boat and it's single screw. And unfortunately, you're not talking about a giant rudder. It's it's a it's a smaller rudder. So you need you need a lot of momentum moving to be able to control it. Yeah, that's it. That's it. And the other, you know, coming from the big boat, like everyone, you know, when you're sport fishing and you've and you've got your wheel, everyone's got these wheels, and it's probably a, the you know the easiest way to do steering, of course. Well, you know, 
a traditional old fashioned way is, you know, sort of pneumatics, hydraulics, you know, you get a hydraulic pump here. And of course, steering like that in reverse, everyone's going to say, well, that's not going to work. That's going to be hard. But so you, you apply this sort of bigger bone technology or the newer stuff is just follow up levers. So you've just got electronic steering and you've just got a little lever to point which direction you want to go. And so I don't even have a wheel on the boat because, you know, we never use them on older Milady and I'm like, oh, why start now? What do you now? What do you have on the ultimate lady? Just a joystick, a joystick, a follow up lever, which is just a, 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 a just a lever where you can set the rudder angle. Okay, and, and that's what I'm using when I'm fishing with. I probably don't remember, but you know, it's sort of on sitting on my seat up in the tower there, there's just a little lever that that got your hand on, and and uh, you just set the degree of the rudder, it stays there, and away you go. And what's really nice about that is. Fighting a fish, ultimately is to an engine, but fighting a fish, if I want to use my rudders going forward um, or reverse, I, I can, and then I can always center them without even looking. You know, you, you, there's a little indent where the center is, so you can always- That is nice. Yeah, so little things. <laughs> it, that is, I know I, for me, whenever I'm running a boat and I'm running it on a fish or something, I'm constantly looking at the rudder angle indicator. Where's yeah. my rudder? where you know why is the boat not doing what i want it to do and then you look and it's like son of a bitch yeah. <laughs> no wonder it won't go that direction i got the rudders pointing the other direction that's it you just so you know I, I can i know i can i know i'm back in back in zero back in straight straight ahead and uh, without looking so. that's that's pretty cool now uh and i told you i was going to bring it up i'm going to bring it up on the new boat then i'm going to ask you to talk about it on, on the ultimate lady is is your sonar uh are you going to put a sonar in the new boat yeah so the the, the sonar on ultimate lady is a, is a max sonar. it's a canadian company and it's it's a big commercial unit like all these all these omni sonars are you know everyone's finally putting these Omni sonars in. And we've had a Furuno Omni sonar and ultimately for a long time. And it's big gear, with big junction boxes. And, and and I'm like, I'm not building a boat and going fishing without one. And so I don't care what we have to do. We've got to, we're going to build this boat around this goddamn sonar. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it, it takes up a lot of headroom. You've got this, you know, this hoist and, and lowers the transducer and then, the transducer on the max about 600 um, millimeters long. And, and anyway, um, we struggled to get it in, you know, we had to really work and, and it, it's sort of, as you come down the stairs from the helm deck, you know, it's an express boat. So as you come down the stairs to the accommodation downstairs, it's just on the left there up against the bulk engine room bulkhead, just fall out of the engine. Room. And yeah, we had to struggle. We struggled to get it in. And, um, but, it's in there and there's a big cupboard with all the, all the toys in there and it takes up quite a bit of storage I've lost, but, uh, yeah, but it, it, it's, it's a great tool. It's a yeah. great, it's a great tool. And they, they've become quite popular here in the States. I, I know you've had it for a while. Uh, there's so many boats that are getting retrofitted. Um, and if you fished on a boat uh, with it, it's really, really nice. But I was very impressed when I was in Australia talking with you about how you guys use it uh, to locate fish. And what I was surprised is the distance you can mark fish and the fact that you could actually tell the kind of fish. Yeah. That's what I was very, I, I to this day, I, I've told the story. I don't know how you do it. Uh, <laughs> But you know, you can literally by looking at your sonar, you can tell if it's a blue marlin or a black marlin. The, the, like, I've used the old Furuno. I haven't used the new one, but the 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 Mac the Mac tuning is is incredible, and we were able to 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 tune it, and we use this peak peak um, peak um, oh god peak discrimination, and it, it's. It's basically for trawlers, right? Where trawlers are hunting down a patch of sardines, you know, like a huge school of anchovy or sardines, whatever. And there's, there'll be a dense part of that school. And that's obviously where you want to target. You want to know where that part is. The same principle applies to, to, to marlin versus, versus other fish. 
without air sacs. You know, they, we all know that air sac was, gives a very strong target, and that's pretty much what we're seeing on the on the sounder when we mark mile. And so, as the air sacs increase, and, uh, as as the fish increases and the air sac increases, this peak discrimination all of a sudden identifies and separates your marlin from everything else. Because, um, to my knowledge, I might be wrong on this, but to my one of the one of the things that people get mixed up with marlin is is manta rays or stingrays. And now I could be wrong, but they, you might be able to tell me, do they have air bladders? I don't think they did. Uh, you know what? The good thing is I'm sitting at a computer right now and I can look that up. Yeah. Um, and, and I know when you, on a regular bottom machine, uh, when, when it not, not the side scanning sonar, but when a regular depth sounder, uh, manta rays get confused for Marlin quite often. All the time. There you All go. the time. Okay. Well, they, they, they must, but we, we don't seem to have that problem with the Mac. When they use this peak discrimination setting um, on, on it, it's, it's, it makes it really easy. Uh, manta rays still have several differences. No swim bladders. Oh, wait a second. No, take it back. Uh, mm -hmm. Rays, skates, and stingrays are closely related to sharks. Just like sharks, they have uh, cartilage skeleton with no swim bladder. Unlike sharks, the bodies of these fish tend to be flat and dislike. Manta rays do not feed on the bottom at all, but filter small plankton from the water as they swim. So it says there's no uh, swim bladder. Yeah, there you go. So there, there you go. There's your answer. And I, I, um, I was in Cairns and... and I, I came across this, this, they have multiple marks on it. Now, I don't know if you've seen it, but you get, you get little gangs of them in cans and, and, uh, and I wrote it off, you know, I'm like, oh, this is like a school of manta rays. And, uh, but sure enough, I, I, I didn't pitch the bait and, uh, we, I still did a, I still did a loop round with my lures and sure enough, we got a bite from a, from a, from a black marlin. Wow. So that's where I'm like, hang on, this, 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 these were supposed to be uh, um, manta rays, but then they're, they're not. So, and this is where I learned. I said, "No way! You know, these these are, these are marking just like marlin. Just because they're in a school, don't don't mean they don't mean manta rays." Yeah. It was the first time I'd seen like five mark five marlin marks on the on the on the sonar, and that's that's what threw me off. Um, thinking that it's not. They, you know, I've seen two of them. You see two of them all together. Yeah. All the time. But not that many, so I wrote it off as being these manta rays. But and because you know they're marked just the same. Um, but the Max sonar with that air bladder gives our mark, gives our red mark a little pink, uh, little pink bit in pink bit in the in, in the mark in the pink ring. So and that's and that's what we use to identify our marks. That, that that's that's pretty neat. That that really is neat that you're you're able to to recognize it and listen, it, it can make the difference on, you know, what you're, you're trying to pitch to the fish. Totally. totally. You know, Oh, that's a black marlin. Let's slow it down and throw, you know, let's throw a bait out there, yeah. Yeah. you know? So that's, I mean, and I've told people and I couldn't remember, but now I'm going to remember how you're able uh, to tell the difference between a black and a blue marlin. Uh, Cause I've told people and they're like, there's no way. And I'm like, no, I'm telling you, why would he lie to me? Yeah. you know uh you can oh let's go make a left there's a marlin about a mile away and that's you know what anybody who's spent time on the water trolling without electronics uh trying to decide whether to go left or right uh is a huge decision that you got to make a hundred times in a day <laughs> Yeah. You know, and listen, it starts off at the very start of the day when you come out the cut or when you're passing the, you know, the reef, do I go left? Do I go right? That's, that's your first decision automatically to start the day. That, that's it. That's it. So we, again, I'm not going to, you might have to convert this for me, but you know, and this, this is a test that everyone, I'll, I'll start back again. The, the other reason I put one in my boat is, 
trying to retrofit sonar as a, I'm sure a lot of listeners or a lot of people are, are struggle trying to retrofit good sonar, good omni sonar is hard. So that's, that's the other reason I did it. You've got to do it now, do it right. And so the people that haven't got sonar, you, I mean, they just don't know what they're missing. Um, and, and the people who do have sonar, if you haven't done this test, you really should do it is next time you catch a marlin, and obviously give it a boat ride, put it in the boat. You gotta, you could pick your weather, hopefully have a reasonable day because it's a lot easier if it's calmer. Um, put some floats on that, on that fish and float that fish down at 50 meters or hundred meters. Now it's a little bit of work to do that. I usually, I, I've done it with two floats and I tried to hang the marlin um, horizontal and then drive around it with your sonar. And, and tune your sonar in. If you're a first-time sonar user, you need to do this. Wow. Wow. I never, I never even thought of that. A little bit of effort. Take the hooks out. You've got to tie the – don't have any steels. I don't think you're going to use a gaff and, and, and gaff the fish. The steel will, will, will give you a, a – A weird reading. Really well. Um, so tie it on. Try, I try to hang mine um, horizontal because that's – and then with the two boys, you can see how it's orientated because this also has the effect. And when you when you broadside to to it, it shows up a lot better to when it's facing you. And Steve Lashley talks about this. Is is I don't know the, the who may fish, be one of the best sonar guys out there. Yeah, talks about it. You know, and, and you know that you this thing's pulsing out there. They. They must be able to feel it. You swim underneath, you're up and down. Or I've never swum in the sonar beam, but if you swim up and if you're up and down, you know, you can feel it. You know, maybe they, they, they turn, and of course, they hear the engines and stuff, and they turn and they, and they face. So the orientation of the fish is also quite good with, with the double boys. Now, I did it with a bit of swell one, one day. And anyway, long story cut short, we, we, we drove out until we sort of lost it, and, and we drove away and we came back. And, until we start marketing again. And we, we were marking ours at a thousand meters um, sporadically, sporadically. It, it didn't come into like constant until 900 meters. Wow. And, and I, I wish I'd videoed it or taken pictures or, or something, but I, I had the boss with me and, and, and it was we were, we were experimenting and, and playing around, but it, it surprised me. I, I was usually setting my, my sonar range to about 650 meters. In cans, I'd set it to 850. Um, bigger fish, bigger mark, you know, see it further. But this was a 300 pounder, measured up 300 pounds, and we suspended it and we, we had them at 900 meters. Now, this, this is also with the stabilized version. If you're buying an Omni sonar, don't, don't, don't buy a second hand that's, secondhand one that's not stabilized. Get the new one that's got the stabilization. And for people who don't understand that, when the boat rocks, the the, the beam, especially the further you get away, will will basically rock and roll off with the it. top and and with the boat. And so stabilize when the boat rocks, the beam is stable. And and you, you're able to increase your range and 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 you don't lose those targets that are further away from you. Um, so yeah, 900 meters. I, I, what's that? Almost 3,000 feet or something. Yeah, that no, that's 3,000 feet or 900. Be two yeah, I mean, miles. you're talking, yeah, almost more than half a mile. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if you can mark a fish, it, it'll let you know. Again, it'll let you know. Oh, let me make a right or make, let me make a left. Now, I, I have a question for you and you that that have used the sonar. I've had a couple of people reach out to me about my personal opinion and my personal feeling on whether um, they should outlaw uh, or ban sonars in, in tournaments. And my personal opinion, and this is my, this is my opinion, um, I, I, everybody I've talked to about it, I said, hey, listen, here's the thing. It, it's like anything else. You mark a fish, but that's not guaranteeing you that fish is going to bite. And I've heard way too many times that people may spend one, two, sometimes three hours chasing a fish and it never bites. And they end up, listen, you end up spending 50% of your day on something that never bit. 
Uh, yeah, is it a good tool? Absolutely. Does it help? Absolutely. Uh, but to outlaw it, my thought behind it was uh, as a captain or crew, uh, captain, owner, crew, whatever, somebody that's fishing, uh, it's like being on bait. You're, you're, you're working a pot of bait. And at what point do you say, okay, this is enough. I'm moving on. There's nothing here. I'm not going to get anything to bite. Let me go look for something else. And, and that's still a decision that's made by you as the captain. <coughs> and that's why uh, I've always said, no, I, I personally won't outlaw it because it's a tool. It's a tool to use. Uh, and it doesn't guarantee you uh, that, that you're going to get the fish to bite. And you, you may end up wasting your time on something uh, that is uh, ends up being not worth it. So you actually drove yourself away from what could have been a, a potential bite. Uh, so I, I don't, I'm asking you, how many times have you seen something like that where son of a bitch, I spent four hours chasing this thing today and he never bit. Yeah. So, so I've, I've, we've chased Marlin for, for an hour, you know, raised it on the, on the pitch to bait, raised it, big fish swam there for a while, went back down to like 50 meters then back down to 70 meters. And we, we just, we drove over it and over and over it. We tried bombing one down to it and, and yeah, and no, no cigar. But, um, yeah, I've, I've been in, I've been in a situation where the sonar helps you and it also drags you away from, from, from it. And, and I've been there and in cans, you, you won't be marking anything on your up and down. But on the sonar, you're seeing everything up in the in the top water column, and um, and you're getting so many marks, and and you're like, oh, is that that's a marlin there? And my little peak discrimination comes up, and you go over and it doesn't bite, and then you and then you're like, well, maybe it wasn't. Maybe you know, you you, you then start to doubt your electronics. You're going around and around and around. There's all this action there, and then you. And you, oh, it's, it's sharks, it's it's chop offs, it's all this tuners, and but there's, there's 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 nothing there. Of course, the marlin are with the chop offs, with the sharks, with the marlin, everything's in there together. Mm. And you, and then you see something, you 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 head off over there, um, chasing something else, and then someone comes in behind you, and you were in the right spot. You know, it was just a matter of time. It's um, waiting it out. And that's that's bad decision on me. I, I knew I was there, and I and then but I got bored. And nothing was biting, and that not. And then the other boats, they don't see anything on their up and down, so they're out of there. But then some other lucky guy comes in and, and, and gets on the nine hundred pounder, you know. Um, and I I've found in cans, you know, there, there can be so many fish, and then of course there's there's so many boats as well. That's on all the Malady, I can't turn quick enough, and and I've marked one and. I've gone over it and it hasn't bit. And by the time I get enough distance away from it and turn it around, even if I if I'm going in reverse and screwing the engines, um, I've seen another 40 footer, Rossi Finlayson, in this particular time. He's gone over it. He's marked it on his up and down, and he's done three passes over it and got it on before I before I've before you can even turn around one time. So um, that's 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 our problem with the big boat, of course. You know, you can't have it every which way but yeah but you're very comfortable we get <laughs> you're yeah. very comfortable oh, and you know and, and it's funny because I, I was having this conversation with somebody the other day um because I, I spent 14 years fishing on the real tight and she was 80 foot uh which is, is nice on the sense of it gives you size but she was a very stable platform she didn't roll and when she rolled she was very deliberate and one of the things that I explained to everybody, because, uh, you know, people, they start look, oh, you're catching a lot of fish with, hold on a second, we're fishing 18 days a month. And our days that we're fishing are 14 and 15 hours long. So we're, we're not catching a lot of fish, we're catching the same amount of fish as you guys are, we're just fishing a lot more time. And after 20 days of fishing, uh, your body's beat up. Now, mind you, at the time, I was also in my 20s. Uh, so yeah, we beat up and body sore, uh, but we'd go and fish on another boat for one day and it's like, oh, 
wait a second, what a huge difference after, you know, even though it's rough and we're tired and 18 days of fishing, but your body doesn't take that constant bouncing around like a, a float and you're able to fish those longer days and it's, it's more comfortable and you're able to, you know, uh, put up not, with you're sleeping you, on the couch. You're sleeping in a bed with a bed. exactly you're sleeping in your bed and, uh, you, you're comfortable. Uh, and okay. So after three days at 12 hours a day, that's 36 hours. And you did, uh, three days at eight hours. That's, that's 24. We just, we literally just fished a, an extra half a day. And, and that may being a big boat or a comfortable boat, it's not just big, but it's comfortable. It makes a huge, huge difference. Yeah. Totally. 100%. 100%. And, uh, you guys, I got a question and I've seen a lot of great videos and I'm asking this question as somebody that I, I've always been the wire guy. I've always been the guy that, you know, when it comes time for a big fish, uh, I'm not very tall. <laughs> I'm vertically challenged. So it's usually somebody that's taller with the gaffs and it's usually me on the wire. But you guys with your, your catamaran style cockpit, you have like this m great middle section. And then you have these two catamaran style areas where you're wiring this fish and i've seen some great videos of uh, of you guys uh you don't have the opportunity of running a fish from from the right side of a cockpit to a left side you have to pick a side and, and that's where you're staying uh so if you could tell us a little bit about that that would be awesome yes yeah, so you, you're right you know like I, I look with envy as, as, you know, I started as a crew on this boat and, 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 uh, you know, some, a long time, some of our long time crew, I'm sure feel the same that we'd look with envy at watching other videos of some fish going from one corner to the other. And, and, and you stay with it, or even if he lets it go, you know, you, the boat's on it and you're able to pick it up on the other corner. And, and we're just like, man, that looks good. But then, then we, as you just said, then we remind ourselves how comfortable we are, but, so we, we, you're right. We do, we do, we, we pick a corner and, and we stay there. Now we do occasionally we do get the opportunity because the, the as a catamaran with where um, the fish can actually go between the two hulls. And, and so you can keep, you can treat each, each corner as a, as a small cockpit and you can go from the corner to corner in the inside. And we've had some fish come up. Um, on the inside as well, un unintentionally. Um, and, and sometimes they're, they're happily tailing down there and we've tagged them as they're under the boat sort of thing, under the, between the two hulls. But yeah, once, once you get, um, once they look like they're going to cross over, you've basically just got to let go and, and go to the other side. Run, run, run the other side. You have to climb back up, run across, and then climb back down. Up the three stairs, across the deck down the other three stairs and and you know the boat and i mean i've i've seen that so there's not that much of a rush we you know we're not gonna there's no point in tripping up on that on that transverse if you like and we take you know, your you time take your time the boat's a little bit slow so we're, we'll, we'll just line it up when you guys are ready and, and we'll, we'll get it again it's uh it, it's one of those things i know when i when I started working on that, on the real tide, I had left the topless, which was a 40 foot game fisherman. That was all of 10 foot wide, which was awesome. You literally could sit in one corner and, uh, between the captain and the fish, it just pulls that corner all the way around and, uh, you don't miss a beat. But then when you're on a boat, that's 20, 20 foot, 21 foot wide, uh, you either walking it across or you're let it, literally just letting it go and, I'm going to go over to the other corner and, and, and deal with it. Cause if not, you end up putting it in the transom and that's a whole nother issue, uh, between fixing it, but having your captain throw something from the bridge, calling you all kinds of, you idiot. That's a $40,000 transom. You just put a blue Marlin in. <laughs> my, my, my boss doesn't like scratches on it. We got blue top side. You know I mean? I don't know how these varnish guys go, go but, Varnish champs, we got blue tops, so we got covers, but of course, the fish knows the covers there. He just swims in front of it or behind it or gets under it and scratches it. But you and tried, 
but you, you tried try everything. It. Yeah. Have you ever tried to push a marlin away with a bit of monofilament, Fred? Like, I mean, we've got monofilament in our hands. We can't push it away. It doesn't happen. <laughs> it doesn't happen. Yeah. Uh, and I learned very quickly and early on in my uh, my career, you know, you look at a leader and you think it's a straight line. Uh, and it, in in theory, here's his theory again, it is a straight line. But what it works out to be, you're just in the middle of a circle. So the fish, just because you grab onto the leader doesn't mean he's going to go straight. No, that fish is going to go in a circle. So that when you grab it and he's sideways to you, if you don't give him some, he's just going to keep swimming into the side of the boat. Um, and ironically, I, and actually, you know him. Uh, ironically, I learned about this um, this theory about a circle when I was working on the rap scallion and the other deckhand was Timmy Richardson. And, uh, I learned really quick because we almost put a blue Marlin into the salon window. Uh, and it's like, what happened there? And it's like, Hey man, it's a circle. Uh, it's not a straight line. He just doesn't keep going. If you're going to hold on to it, all you're going to do is turn him right into the side of the boat. Uh, so we learned or I learned anyway. So, uh, if you don't walk with him or give him a little bit, uh, he's just going to keep turning into the boat. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. a great, I, we've lost a pretty good tournament because of that. Yeah. Same thing. It just circled around, went, went under the boat. Now rudders on old way stick out and oh. uh, it, it just got caught around the rudder and, and close to the end. We, and we broke the leader off. It, it's, it's one of those, again, you just learn with time where, if that fish is going up and, and you're not as a, as a, a wire man, if I'm not hearing the engine spool to go with me, I need to let it go. Um, and, and you don't even think about it. You know, it's one of those things we're talking about it now. Uh, but when it's happening, you don't even think about it. Uh, it's if, if those engines aren't spooling up and we're not starting to move, I got to let it go because if not, all I'm doing is pulling him back into or under the boat. Uh, so I, I'm better off with saying, okay, let it go and uh, and let my captain catch up and get the fish, get in front of that fish again. Um, but again, those are just things that you learn over time and uh, after many mistakes. After many mistakes. <laughs> oh, wise Yoda. Yes. Uh, oh, man. It's so funny say Yoda uh we're getting to the age and I I was I think it was on one of the podcasts I was speaking with somebody recently I don't remember when it happened where I was the young guy running around from boat to boat asking all the questions to uh I'm the old guy on the boat where everybody's coming to me and asking me questions <laughs> it just happens that fast happens that fast I was on the phone to Tim Richardson, the mac and the mackerel. The mackerel. I was on the mackerel the other day, and um, it was my birthday. I just turned forty-four. And congratulations, and happy birthday! You made it. Uh, we nobody thought you were a girl to make it, but you made it. <laughs> I know. And and the mackerel's like he's fifty or something. I'm like, you're an old boy now. Remember, remember in cans, you know, maybe used to talk about the old boys, Laurie Ride, uh, Peter B. And, you're and, the old guy now. And you're the old guy now. You're the old boys. Yeah, it's it, that fast. I, I I hate it. I'm uh, I'm 47. I'm gonna be 48 this year. And I've always rounded up my birthdays. <laughs> I just after you know after the new my birthday's in August. So by the time we get to the new year, I just rounded up. Okay, I'm I'm 48. <laughs> I'm not rounding as fast. And, <laughs> and 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 what caught me what caught me was recently I was talking with somebody. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm almost 50. And I'm like, whoa, hold on. That's two and a half years. I'm going to enjoy every single minute. I'm going to cut. I'm going to enjoy every single minute. No way. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it does. It's, it, and it does. It creeps up on you. And uh, I, I'm on a couple of group text message with some boat captains. And I hear them complaining about their deckhands. Uh, and I'm like, whoa, time out a second, guys. Hold on. You guys are just being grumpy old guys. They're no different than we were. They really aren't. They're doing the same things. It looks different because 
whether it's, you know, they're, they're talking on their iPhones or they're doing, they're doing something a little bit different. They're using different techniques, but they're not doing anything different than, than we were They're They're going out to the bars at night, the same way we were They're They're chasing girls the same way we were. Um, I, uh, it was a tournament. I can't remember if it was this year or last year. It was a group. There was three, I say three decades. We're all, you know, we were just going, we're out fishing with our friends and there's three of us getting our tackle ready, but we all grew up and we're all at the same age, you know, between that 47 to 53 range. And, uh, we're all trying to tie knots and we're grabbing our line and putting it up to the light and trying to, you know, tie a knot here. Nobody's reaching into their bag to grab their cheaters. <laughs> I got them everywhere. And, uh, we're, we're trying to fight it off and trying to tie these knots. And finally one of us, it's like, Hey man, why don't we just grab the glasses before we tie a knot that slips and we don't win the tournament. And, and then I, then I just busted out. I said, you know, I remember when the three of us would show up to a boat, tie knots, rig baits after coming straight from the bar to the boat, still, still drunk, getting ready to go fishing a tournament. And now we're talking about, we can't see the line. I go another 10 years. We're going to talk about the fact that we can't poop. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to think about that just yet. <laughs> it's oh. listen, it's the natural progression. It's, it's, it's what happens, but you know, you learn so much and you know, I don't know about you in Tahiti uh, because I've never been to Tahiti. So I, I don't know exactly. You're coming. You're going to come. No, no, no. I'm definitely, listen, the, the whole idea with your boat being built uh, we had, when I was in Australia, we had talked about flying down there to shoot videos about, you know, this boat being built. And then now we're on complete lockdown. I was supposed to be in Australia last year um, and we postponed it to this year, but now I don't even know if it's going to happen. It, it's, it's all dependent on, uh, I, I know last, before we jumped on the podcast, I was actually, uh, I got the message from you. Hey, I'm ready whenever you are. I was talking with my contact in, in Japan. Um, we were getting ready uh, this year. We were going to do uh, the first all release blue Marlin tournament in Okinawa, Japan. And um, we had signed a deal with the Hilton to, to put the, the tournament out of uh, on out of the Hilton. But one of the things that the Hilton had asked us and myself was, listen, we're more than happy to, to support you. Would you guys be interested in doing four events um, a year here? And I'm like, sure, why not? Let's do it. I, I don't, you know, I don't care, but we can't travel. I, I, I don't, I don't want to commit to anything uh, until um, we know we can start traveling again. So I will be in Tahiti. I promise you, I will be in Tahiti. And then I'm, we're going to wrap up here because I know you got to get going. Um, but one thing for me, uh, I'm very big on is, uh, the next generation. I I've been very fortunate. I've had a bunch of mentees. One of them I have to reach out to. He's, he's up to 36. I met him when he was 14. He was the washdown boy, uh, for my boss's son. And, uh, even now I have, and you probably see him on social media with me as young Tarzan. He's 11, uh, and I think it's really important to help that next generation coming up uh, to show them what the mistakes that we've already made. Don't do it, you know, or how can we, what can we do to help you become a better fisherman? And it really helps uh, that, you know, the next generation. And I like, this is, I don't have kids. I, I believe you have one son, one son and one stepdaughter and one stepdaughter. So I don't have any children to pass the legacy on. So it's very important to me, anybody that shows the enthusiasm for our industry, I want to open up every door possible here. This is, I have it as long as you respect it the way I respect it. Uh, I want to open the doors. I want to make it easier for you guys to do this kind of stuff. Cause I've had plenty of people open up doors for me. So um, on that note, uh, is there anything you want to wrap up with? Can you let everybody know if they want to check out your, your stories about your, uh, the boat being built, where they can find that at? 
Yes, yeah, Seawolf Expeditions. Um, there's Instagram, Facebook, uh, and of course, Ultimate Lady. Uh, so, ultimatelady.com is our website for Ultimate Lady, and we're also on Facebook. And yeah, seawolfexpeditions.com, the website, and you'll be able to find the links to the Facebook and Instagram page. All right. Well, uh, on that, I'm going to don't hang up yet, but we're going to wrap this up. Uh, everybody, thank you so much for your time. We are. Uh, you can listen to this one and every other podcast on Facebook, YouTube, uh, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google, Google Plus, you name it, wherever you get your podcast, your favorite place. My favorite is Alexa. Uh, when And I tell the story every time when I'm at my buddy's house. Alexa, play Fly Navarro's No BS. And you got to listen to me not once, but twice in stereo. All righty. Tom, thank you so much. Everybody, thank you so much for your time. And we will talk to everybody later. Thank you very much.